perfect. Hey everybody, today we're going to be covering coronary artery disease. It's part of the cardiac series that we are performing. Um, if you haven't watched the hypertension video, there's going to be a link at the end of the uh, at the end of the video. So go ahead and click that link so you can watch that video. Um, we're going to be covering the pathophysiology, the nursing diagnostics, the nursing interventions, and the medical treatment that's involved with coronary artery disease. So let's get started. Okay, so what is coronary artery disease? It is a heart disease that results from the narrowing of the coronary arteries due to atherosclerotic plaque. Well, how would somebody get atherosclerotic plaque? Well, there's some risk factors associated with it. So um, the number one risk factor is high cholesterol and obesity. Um, you know, after a long period of time of somebody taking in a high fatty diet, you know, gaining weight, uh, not really taking care of themselves, the lipid that's inside, the, the lipid is going to aggregate onto the arterial wall and will later on build up and build up, therefore blocking the, uh, the blood flow of, um, within the coronary arteries. Second reason why um, why somebody could obtain coronary artery disease is hypertension. Hypertension, it's turbulent blood flow that over time damages the endothelial layer of the, of the coronary arteries, which makes it easier for lipid to aggregate onto those, um, onto those damaged sites. And so also platelets could also aggregate onto those um, damaged sites, which could turn into a complicated lesion, which we'll talk about later in this video. So the third risk factor for coronary artery disease is smoking. Um, it has the same concept as hypertension. Over time, when a patient is smoking uh, for many years, it can cause damage onto the endothelial layer, which allows lipid to aggregate onto the arterial wall. What are the causes of coronary artery disease? Well, the number one reason, the number one cause of coronary artery disease is atherosclerotic plaque. Um, over time, lipid is going to aggregate onto those endothelial on the endoth endothelial layer of the coronary arteries, which is going to decrease the amount of ox uh, oxygenated blood to the myocardium. Um, second reason why coronary arter artery disease does exist is genetics. And number three is vessel spasms. Vessel spasms is a collapse of the arterial, uh, of the arterial wall due to some kind of stimulant that is being used by the patient. For example, if someone is taking in cocaine, for example. So if somebody's using cocaine, it's going to collapse the arterial wall and cause a vessel spasm, therefore decreasing blood flow to the coronary arteries and the myocardium. Okay, so for the pathophysiology behind coronary artery disease, it's important to understand what the goal is for coronary artery disease, right? Or any type of, uh, for any type of cardiac disease, it's important to know what the goal is. Well, what the goal is is to increase the supply of oxygen, increase O2 supply, and decrease the demand of oxygen. Decrease the demand. Okay, understanding the risk factors behind it, behind coronary artery disease, will give you a better image of what's actually happening within the arterial walls. Um, so the risk factors are high cholesterol, smoking, hypertension. So with smoking and hypertension, what that's gonna do over time is going to cause damages onto the arterial wall. So your arterial wall is no longer perfect. So why is that significant? Well, with high cholesterol in somebody who's not living the, uh, the, you know, the healthiest lifestyle, 
that lipid is going to aggregate onto the arterial wall. And over time, it's going to build up and build up and build up, and plaque is going to develop. So why is that issue? Well, it's uh, over time, your arterial walls can get narrower and narrower due to atherosclerotic plaque. So that means the supply of oxygen going through your arteries are going to become less and less due to the uh, due to the insignificant room that the art the artery is holding uh, from the <clears throat> from the lipid that's uh, building up. So. Um, so over time, what happens is that our cells within the myocardium, our cells within the myocardium is going to switch from an aerobic metabolism, which all our cells go through, which is a normal process, to an anaerobic metabolism. So um, with, with anaerobic metabolism, our, the myocardium is going to is going to become a acidic environment due to the buildup of lactic acid and it's going to panic. When it panics over time it's going to switch to a rhythm called ventricular fibrillation also known as V-fib. Well that's not good because V-fib if not caught early enough could lead to death. Okay so what does this mean for the coronary arteries? Well, our body is always trying to figure out a way to compensate for itself. So, um, when the uh, when the coronary arteries are blocked with with um, with you know high lipid content, you know causing atherosclerotic plaque, something uh, um, the coronary arteries are going to compensate by using something called collateral circulation, meaning that. Arteries are going to branch off the um, arteries going to branch off the coronary arteries onto another segment and try to bring as much blood flow to the myocardium. Think of it as a a roadblock, and the arteries are, the arteries are trying to find a detour around to bring oxygenated blood supply to the myocardium. Okay, so what are some nursing assessments that we can do for a patient who has coronary artery disease? Well, uh, you, wanna, you wanna do some objective assessments, right? You wanna check their vital signs. What's their blood pressure like? What's their heart rate like? Are they receiving enough, enough oxygen? Is their O2 above 95%? Um, also, another important, important concept and intervention to do is putting a 12 lead EKG on the patient. So the reason we want to do that is because we have a better visual visualization of the of the heart rhythm uh, to determine what's actually going on within the coronary arteries. Um, so, for example, we put a 12 lead EKG on a patient, and it comes out to be first example. Um, we have our P wave, our Q, R, S, and T are elevated. So this is our ST segment, S, T. If our ST segment is elevated, that means it's indicative of a myocardial infarction, right? So if, if we see this on the monitor, we, it's most important for, uh, for us to call the physician and let them know that we do see an ST elevation um, and it's probably important for us to bring this patient to the cath lab to reperfuse and revascularize. If one artery is affected, uh, typically they'll, they'll usually put in a stent. Uh, if, multiples, if multiple arteries are affected, that's when they'll do a cabbage, a coronary artery by, bypass graft. So, so the second example of what you'll see on a rhythm is that you'll see the P wave, a normal P wave, a QR, then a the ST is depressed. It, is, um, it makes this 
U shape, right? So if we see ST depression on the rhythm strip, that means the patient is having myocardial ischemia, meaning they are not able to deliver oxygenated blood flow to the myocardium. So there's some kind of block going on, but it's not a complete block. A full block is considered to be an ST elevation, meaning the arteries are completely spasmed. There's no more blood flow go going through that coronary artery and reaching the myocardium. Therefore, switching it to an aerobic, uh, anaerobic metabolism. Some nursing interventions, um, depending on what they are taking, possibly nitroglycerin, um, sublingual under the tongue, um, giving the patient some oxygen, and then um, po you know a possible stent could be placed in uh, to reperfuse that that coronary artery. So for the subjective assessment, what would you want to ask the patient? Well, you want to ask them. What's their pain like? So we break that down into P, Q, R, S, T. P is provoke and palliative. What makes, it, what makes the pain worse? What makes it better? Q is for quality. Is it burning? Is it squeezing? Is it heavy pain? R is radiate. Does it radiate to your arm, your back, your neck, your jaw? Severity on a scale of one through 10. How do you rank your pain? T is for timing. How long, does your, how long does your pain last? All right, so there's different types of angina, right? So we have stable angina, unstable angina, variant angina, also known as Prince metal. So for the characteristics behind this, for stable angina, it is pain with movement and relief at rest, making it predictable, meaning you know when the pain is going to start. Unstable angina, it's going to be pain with movement and then uh, pain with rest, making it unpredictable. We don't know when the pain is gonna start. And then for Prince metal or variant angina, it's pain at rest. So what causes stable angina? Well, it's gonna be the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque. Um, the more plaque that's built up into that artery, uh, the decreased amount of oxygen oxygenated blood flow to the myocardium, therefore the buildup of lactic acid, which equals pain. Um, for what causes unstable angina? Atherosclerotic plaque and a thrombus formation, right? Making it a complicated lesion, which increases the risk for an MI. So let me go back for a second. What makes it complicated? So that thrombus formation that's built up on the atherosclerotic plaque it can break off any time and go to either your lungs causing a pulmonary embolism or go into the brain causing a stroke. So that's what makes it, makes it a complicated lesion. So a complicated lesion, complicated relationship. Also, an increased risk of a myocardial infarction. Why? Because with these two combinations, um, the, cor the coronary artery now has a smaller gap in between for blood flow uh, to get through, uh, causing an ST elevation, meaning now the coronary artery is closed. Um, so how about the cause for a Prince metal variant, variant angina? Um, so what causes it is that it's a vessel wall spasm. So anything that's gonna stimulate it, such as smoking, use of um, um, drugs such as cocaine is going to cause that uh, artery to spasm, make it close, and could cause an ST elevation, meaning a heart attack could possibly happen. So what is the quality of stable? Squeezing, heavy pain, burning pain, unstable angina, same situation. Squeezing, heavy, burning pain. Prince metal, squeezing pain. EKG, what does an EKG look like for stable angina? Uh, you're gonna see an ST depression, meaning uh, that means there's not gonna be a enough blood flow flowing to the myocardium but there is blood flow flowing through but it's not completely closed off how about for unstable angina st depression again you're going to see myocardial ischemia for prince metal or variant angina 
you're going to see an ST elevation. Why? Because your coronary arteries is spasm, meaning the coronary arteries close for a brief ep for a brief episode, causing that ST to elevate, which which causes the myocardial infarction. So what are the t what is the timing for stable angina? The timing is less than five minutes. That means pain is felt for less than five minutes. How about unstable angina? Pain is gonna be felt for greater than 10 minutes. How about Prince Metal variant? It depends on caused by a stimulant or smoking or taking illicit drugs. It, it's, caused by, it's caused within episodes. Treatment for stable angina? Nitroglycerin, sublingual, meaning uh, you're gonna take these tablets of this nitroglycerin and place it under the tongue um, to absorb. So for the first time, you're gonna take it, and if there's no pain relief within five minutes, you take a second one. So you wait another five minutes, if there's still no pain relief, dial 911, take a third tablet under the tongue, and don't take any more after that. Um, so what the nitroglycerin is gonna do is gonna cause a vasodilation of your coronary arteries to open up your arteries to allow enough uh, to allow sufficient blood flow to enter the myocardium. Another um, another method is you know rest, have the patient rest, and meds. Some antihypertensive medications if they were placed on before, beta blockers which is going to help cause vasodilation, um, calcium channel blockers for smooth muscle relaxation. Um, if they're taking ACE inhibitors, um, any angiotensin receptor blockers. You know, that could also help as well. How about treatment for unstable angina? Well, the goal, since it is um, almost completely blocked due to that thrombus and atherosclerotic plaque combination, we would want to reperfuse and revascularize that, um, that coronary artery by getting them to a cath lab and placing a stent or getting them to OR and um, initiating a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. After that, it's important for them to be placed on anticoagulants. So they might they may be placed on a heparin drip, um, and warfarin when they go home, just to just to prevent any uh, clotting from occurring. Um, so how about for treatment for variant angina? We want to increase the O2 supply and decrease the demand. Okay, so what are some medications that's given for coronary artery disease? Um, so the treatment is that for, for prevention, we would want to use aspirin and Plevix, right? Those are your antiplatelet medications. Um, the only contraindication behind that is that if a patient has ever had a hemorrhagic stroke, we kind of want to avoid um, giving aspirin and Plevix due to um, the decreased amount of platelet that's going to be aggregating. The second line of treatment is that we want to give niacin and your statin medications, so um, such as statin medications like atorvastatin, right? Something that's significant about those medications that you want to give it at night because it's metabolized better. The, the liver metabolizes better at night. Um, so usually around like 2100 or, or like around um, like 9 o'clock p.m. you want to give it before the patient falls asleep. Um, what's niacin going to do? It's going to help increase the, the HDL, you know, that that happy cholesterol, that good cholesterol. Um, but something that's important behind is that you wanna give it 30 minutes apart if the patient is taking aspirin. Um, because what it's gonna do is gonna cause extreme flushing. So make sure you're, you know, you're being mindful of that. Um, going back to statins, a big contraindication by taking uh, atorvastatin and it's not metabolized correctly, it can cause rhabdomyolysis. So the classic triad of symptoms that you're gonna see with rhabdomyolysis is increased heart rate, a fever, and brown urine. So it's very mind, you need to be very mindful of uh, the contraindications of giving a, you know, any um, statin medications. Third line of medications, your antihypertensives. You know, if the patient's already taking it, that's great. You know, for example, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, the preferred route is giving beta blockers to help with the vasodilation, to help open up those coronary arteries. 
calcium channel blocker is also great too. You know, it's gonna help with smooth muscle relaxation, also help with vasodilation. Okay, so what are some diagnostics that we can do to actually diagnose coronary artery disease? So we can draw some labs. Um, some labs we wanna draw is cardiac enzymes. Um, the, the reason why we wanna draw some cardiac enzymes is to see if the heart has been damaged. When the heart has been damaged, uh, it's gonna release it's going to release an enzyme called troponin that's specific to the myocardium. Also, we, we can also look for CKMB, but troponin is the one that we want to look for. So another test that we can do is a cholesterol test because we want to see how high uh, the cholesterol levels are and if atherosclerotic plaque has built up and caused a narrowing of that coronary artery. So second thing we want to do, we want to put a 12 lead AKG on them, right? So why do we want to do that? We want to see if there's an ST elevation, meaning uh, is there a myocardial infarction incurring or is it ST depression? Is there myocardial ischemia? Is there not enough oxygenated blood flow going, flowing to the myocardium, leading to an acidic environment of the heart? Third, third way we can diagnose coronary artery disease is a stress test. So what is a stress test? Stress test is getting the heart to a level of causing um, uh, almost an ST elevation to see how, uh, how much plaque is built up within those coronary arteries. So there's two ways we can do it. We can do it by an exercise, allowing the patient to either jog on a treadmill to see if that ST, will, uh, ST segment will elevate, or if, the, if they're unable to move, we can give, uh, there's a medication called dibutamine to cause their heart to uh, beat faster and react to this medication, leading it to an ST elevation. If, it, if there's an ST elevation that does occur, we gotta get them to a cath lab as soon as possible, either put in a stent or bring them to OR and be prepared for a cabbage. All right, so here's a question that I developed. Go ahead and read and pause the video and go ahead and answer it. All right, another question that I developed, go ahead, pause and read the question and the answer will be available for you. Okay, so that's the end of the video. Uh, today we've discussed the pathophysiology, some nursing interventions, the diagnostics, some treatment, uh, surgical outcomes of coronary artery disease. Um, if you like this video, make sure to give it a like. Um, if you have subscribed, make sure to subscribe and share the video. And uh, next video will be out in a couple days. So thank you for watching and have a great day.